All right. Hello and welcome to Micromaterialism, where we break down an interesting subject from material science into a bite-sized chunk about 10 minutes long. Today, I'm joined not only by my co-host, Andrew Falkowski, and audio expert, Jared Duffy, but we have Matthew Cohen from Pangea Ventures here to talk about trying to get your material science idea out of the laboratory and onto a commercial product. So, Matt, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. Big fan of the, the podcast and uh, evangelizing material science in general. Awesome. Well, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So uh, I'm the director of technology at a venture capital firm called Pangea Ventures. And we look to invest in companies that are leveraging uh, material science kinds of innovations that can have a positive impact on the world. I've been here since uh, late 2012. And before that, my academic background was mostly in material science and engineering. Um, did my undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania and then uh, spent some time at a startup in the realm of printed electronics and then went to the University of Cambridge in the UK where I studied uh, micro and nanotechnology enterprise. And when you think about venture capital, rarely do you think about it from a materials standpoint, right? Like typically materials are more of the, the supply that's being used to fuel a technology and people invest in the technology. So how is that a little bit different? And what are some of the unique challenges that go with that? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're totally right. The vast majority of venture capital funding is not in companies that are developing new materials or using new materials and, and material processes in novel ways. Uh, which we think is, is kind of a challenge, but also an opportunity for us. So one of the big things with material science type startups is that the value chain can be a big impediment to growing a scalable, venture backable kind of business. And, and what I mean by that is that companies that are developing materials usually are pretty far away from the end customers. So something that goes into your iPhone might rely on innovations in how you process silicon carbide or some other type of compound semiconductor, but there's so many steps in between that person developing the innovation in silicon carbide and a smartphone that the value capture can be very, very challenging. So trying to find opportunities where you can not only create a lot of value, but capture some of that value tends to be one of the big challenges that, that we face. So Matt, uh, sort of leading off of that, is it common for you to run into companies who are like, hey, we've got this cool new material and it can be used in like XYZ, you know, all these different applications. I feel like from my experience starting companies, it's really easy to get distracted. Um, you can end up with all these things that you could potentially do or do a little bit in, and then you don't do anything really well. So is your role as the venture capital firm, you know, providing the funding, but also now some of the oversight to help direct them to the most profitable? And have you seen examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a definite challenge when it comes to materials, because something might be able to do a whole lot of different interesting things and trying to figure out what is practical how much money is it going to take to get there? How quickly can we get something onto the market and how much can we scale that up in a reasonable time frame? is a pretty big challenge. And especially people that are coming from the technical side tend to struggle with. So just because you can develop a novel kind of photovoltaic cell or something like that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best application or the easiest to market or what that, that should actually look like. So, you know, for us, we certainly try to provide guidance and feedback and, and show some of the things that have gone wrong and some of the mistakes we've made over the, the 20 years that we've been doing this. But I think we generally look for companies that have found some level of product market fit already and are looking to kind of accelerate that. So in my mind, venture capital dollars are not necessarily good at solving fundamental materials and engineering challenges as much as they are around um, kind of going from, let's say, three to 10. So once we've sort of developed what the material is, how we might be able to produce it and why, and that's kind of getting specced in. And now maybe you have a purchase order, but you need to bring in more money to actually execute on that. That can be where venture capital dollars can really make a big impact. And do you fund companies that are sort of in this valley of death region that you say three to 10, does that include like, do you want something that's already built in like a device or are you okay with like a technology that it has opportunity, but it's not been shown yet? Yeah. So primarily we focus on supporting companies that we consider to be at an early growth type stage. And the way that we define that internally here are um, companies with the majority of a team in place typically have some IP in the form of uh, granted or, or at least filed patents. And importantly, we're generally investing in companies with some level of commercial product on the market at the time of okay. initial investment. So they don't necessarily have a sellable product, but maybe they have a very clear line of sight to that. So something like a purchase order that 
they need to, some money to help fulfill. Um, generally, that's the place where we like to get involved. We will make some exceptions and things that are very high potential, but a little bit earlier than that. But we do want to see that kind of product market fit identified. So there's a lot of really great blue sky research out there and interesting development. But I think honestly, we are not the right type of financial vehicle to be supporting a lot of that. That's often where things like non-dilutive funding in the form of grants and business plan competitions and university research, that tends to be a much better role mm -hmm. for it versus uh, a group like us. Can you provide a couple examples of some companies that you've worked with and where they were when you started working with them versus where they are now? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think one great example and definitely a company that is developing some or leveraging some material science type innovation to, to make some interesting products that can help uh, change the world is a company called Redland Technologies. So this company is based uh, on Vancouver Island in Canada, and they have developed a method to produce cadmium zinc telluride or CZT, which is a compound semiconductor in a sort of more efficient way to uh, improve yields and, and lower costs. And they use this CZT for um, detectors for medical imaging type applications. So things like CT scans and full body nuclear imaging. And by utilizing better detectors, you can reduce the radiation dosage that patients are undergoing when they're getting these types of procedures done. Uh, so we started looking at this company back in the early 2000s, not too long after Pangea formed. The company has been around since I think 1999. And we invested in the company in um, when the company had some sales mostly in things like baggage handling and security. They were also providing some cadmium telluride for solar cell applications. But really the future that we saw for them was developing CZT for radiation detectors. And now fast forward to today, um, the company is working with the majority of the largest CT OEMs in the world. They've moved from just making really good CZT crystals all the way to making uh, kind of sub modules and getting involved in things like the ASICs and the software needed to utilize their material. And they've kind of gone progressively up the value chain to get to uh, a closer to an end product. And yeah, that, that's been kind of a, a big success story, but it all goes to them being able to make CZT better and more efficiently than most other people have historically been able to. So one question I've got with all this is what's the typical fund uh, that you uh, invest into a new company? I, what's the range that you're looking to invest in companies? Right. So typically for us, we'll invest up to about maybe three to five million U.S. dollars initially in a company. And then we'll usually reserve a similar amount of capital for follow on or expansion kinds of investments. So usually for venture capital funded companies, you don't take all of the money you'll ever need right at the onset, which doesn't make sense because oftentimes the value of your company is relatively low. So there'd be a lot of what's called dilution or the ownership in your company would be going to the funders. Whereas taking a more milestone based approach and splitting up the money over different tranches or different investment rounds, things like a series A or series C or, or whatever tends to be the standard way to go. And, and I think that's a kind of a win-win for everyone involved. So you're sort of reducing risk a little bit and you're hopefully hitting milestones along the way. Um, and maybe on that topic, I guess that's often a challenge for material startups in that commercially relevant milestones aren't always hit in the typical timeframes of a venture capital investment. So usually mm -hmm. as an asset class, we're set up to invest in companies and support them for maybe one to two years after a financing. But oftentimes when we talk about materials, so things from nylon to whatever, those are often measured in decades, right? Yeah. From initial discovery to actually having spandex or, or other kinds of interesting commercial products. So there's a big disconnect there when we're talking about 18 months of funding and you might need 10 years to take a project out of the lab. So finding those companies that are sort of right on the, the cusp or right on the precipice of commercial expansion, that's kind of the challenge. And that's where we think we have developed a, a kind of strategy to, to help mitigate some of those risks. But it also means that 99 plus percent of the companies we speak to are not quite in that sweet spot that we look for. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, we're looking for kind of diamond in the rough there. So do you keep tabs on a number of potential companies at all times and you're just sort of waiting for them to mature to that, that age that you're looking for? 
Absolutely. Yeah. That's something that we really pride ourselves in doing and being very proactive and going out and looking at companies, even if they are years away from maybe being a perfect fit for our fund, because we think it's helpful to understand the landscape and figure out what's out there, what might be out there in a couple of years from now. And the other thing that's a little unique about us as a fund is the majority of our limited partners. So the majority mm -hmm. of the actual investors in our fund are strategic in nature, and they comprise some of the world's leading materials and chemicals and electronics kinds of companies that we work fairly closely with. So of course we want to provide financial returns as a VC fund, but these are multi-billion dollar companies that are making uh, not multi-billion dollar investments in our fund. So they have some motivation beyond strictly financial returns in why they want to invest in companies like ours. And we think we can provide a nice window on innovation to see some of the cutting edge startups or, or sometimes pre-startups that are being formed across North America and to some extent all over the world. I've got a question for you. Uh, so it's very easy to do these short-term investments in things like software companies. And you're even saying that in the materials world, you're intentionally looking at things with a that are close to being successful. But if you look at the stuff that's really going to change the world around us, like lithium ion batteries, right? Those were discovered first, like what, the sixties or seventies. Like it, it took decades yeah, for those. A to lot get of here. interesting kind of stuff happening in the early nineties. So I mean, yeah. Right. So I guess my question is who's out there making these investments in really early stage stuff that is potentially, you know, going to be dramatically game changing or are we just missing it altogether? Like is nobody investing in this? And is that, is that going to come back to bite us? Are we just going to make better and better software, but we're not going to get these things that really transform society? What do you think? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think we are somewhat fortunate having a very robust academic ecosystem and national lab infrastructure here in the United States. And there's some similar analogies all over the world where a lot of inventions and a lot of technologies are not really at a stage that might be a fit for venture capital or for being private companies in general, but they are really interesting, really promising, but these could be 20, 30, 40 year bets where the fundamental science is really interesting, but turning that fundamental breakthrough in science into a real technology and then turning that technology into a business, that doesn't happen overnight and it can't happen overnight. And if it does, it's probably not all that fundamental of a breakthrough. So, you know, I, I think we as venture capitalists are not going to solve that issue. Uh, and, but it, it is something that we kind of think about. And it's also a reason that certain areas are probably not going to see a ton of venture capital funding, at least from traditional areas, just because that kind of risk return profile, especially when you layer on top the uh, time horizon component, that math just doesn't always add up to, to making it kind of work. So I guess one example I can think of would be something like nuclear fusion. So there's lots of great technologies out there around getting to that or for maybe small nuclear reactors using fission. But oftentimes these requires hundreds of millions of dollars, a decade or more of work. And for most traditionally structured venture capital firms, that just doesn't really look like an investment that they can do. What, what do you think about companies like, I'm thinking of like QuantumScape. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Uh, they're interested in solid state batteries. They've gotten a ton of, of venture capital back. Was, was it the Gates Foundation? I can't remember who invested in them, but they've got yeah. a lot of funding. Like they're not, it's not a small operation and yet it is extremely early stage. Uh, what thoughts do you have on companies and, and that sort of approach? Right. So, I mean, we've invested in a number of battery companies over the years, and it's definitely a challenging area. I think there's a, a good quote that's been floating out there over the years that there's, there's liars out there, and then there's liars, and then there's battery materials developers. <laughs> so <laughs> we, um, we're not an investor in QuantumScape. I, I think what they're doing is certainly interesting and very high potential. So the move towards solid state batteries and being able to improve energy density and improve safety is a really interesting problem to, to solve. For them, the, the, what I think of for QuantumScape is the SPAC that they did. So a SPAC is a special purpose acquisition company, but it's basically a way of taking a company public without doing a traditional initial public offering and, or an IPO. And QuantumScape did a very large SPAC pretty recently within the last couple of months where it's uh, an incredible amount of money went into the company at a very high valuation and the company is not expecting to have any meaningful commercial product for at least a few more years. So it's interesting yeah. to see that a company can become a public company with mostly development level work to date and no expected revenue for at least three or four more years. So 
looking at the companies that you have invested in, what are some of the positive impacts that you've seen on within those companies and even on the industry as a whole as a result of your ventures? Yeah, so impact is a really important consideration in any investment that we make. And importantly, we don't think there, that it's mutually exclusive to have the best financial returns and make the most impact or do the most social good for, for individuals and, and for the world at large. So we release an impact report every year and I welcome you to have a look at our website and you can look at the last couple of years of our impact reports, but we track four key metrics and each of our portfolio companies will influence these metrics in different ways, but they generally align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs, which some of you might have some familiarity with. Uh, but we look at reducing um, CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent emissions, um, freshwater production, impacting health and lives of individuals. And then um, the final thing is, oh, uh, food production. So those are our four areas. So most of our portfolio companies are not going to have an impact on every single one of those four metrics, but often there are companies that do overlap and, and hit a number of them. So we've invested in a company, for instance, that is developing novel biopesticides from peptides that are um, naturally occurring in things like spiders and sea anemones. And they can improve health lives by getting rid of some toxic um, chemicals that are out there for pesticides. They can reduce fresh water by using their products and they uh, have the ability to produce more food by reducing insects and, and other kinds of yield sapping issues in, in fields today. So very cool. All right, Matt, before we go, I would be you know, remiss if I didn't give a chance for our listeners to sort of channel through me to say, how do I do this, right? Because I think a lot of material science students want to change the world. They're excited because it's a field that isn't about developing the technology of next season. It's the one that's five years out or 10 years out. So they're thinking big picture. And if there are currently students or if they even have an idea, what's the next move, do you think? What, how do they get uh, commercialized and actually on the shelf? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm sure I will not give a perfectly satisfactory answer here, since I think uh, you could probably write a book on the subject, <laughs> and many have. But for me, I think the first thing to remember when you're commercializing a technology, especially one that is leveraging some hard science, hard tech, material science type innovation, is that people don't really care that much about the technology. They want to know what problem you're solving. So focus on the why more so than the how. The how is important, of course, and any investor is gonna to want to know how you do this. But if they don't understand why you do it or why it's important what you're doing, it doesn't really matter, right? I'm not even gonna bother learning about how you do it if I don't care about why you're doing it. So Matt, I teach an entrepreneurship class here in our material science and engineering department. Uh, right now, the book I think that we're using currently, we're using Lean Startup and Zero to One. What else should I be teaching them? It's a good question. Yeah, so the, I think you're in the right place already with the Lean Startup. Definitely is good. Some of that can be a little challenging around how do we take the Lean Startup methodology and apply that to materials? Because it works great for software when you can yeah, it it's, every week if you want. It's right. really hard when I got to tell my engineer to make something and it takes forever. Yeah, a minimum viable product in materials does not happen with two people in a garage on a weekend, right? That's just not how this development works. So tuning the expectations and what an actual minimum viable product looks like is important here because it's not going to be apples to apples comparison if you're developing something for making the next app or something in, in enterprise software, for instance. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. Um, well, maybe I'll plug myself here for a second. It hasn't come out yet, but I did write a chapter for a book. Uh, the book is called How to Commercialize Chemical Technologies for a S Sustainable Future. And I, I wrote a chapter around raising investment and raising financing. So that could be a potential resource to, to have a look at moving forward. I think it should be published in, in 2021. Uh, so it's a little primer on, on Send that Send us one. a copy. We'll do a review. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe come back on for, <laughs> for yeah. a future episode to talk about it, but I'm happy to, to do that. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt. This has been a really interesting conversation. We may actually follow up and chat with you a little bit more because it's not many people out there that are actively in this space of helping us commercialize material science. So we appreciate you coming to join us today. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me and would love to talk again. And if there's any of our portfolio companies that you're intrigued by or want to learn more about, by all means, let me know. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And before we go, we'd just like to give a thank you to Matt Match, Elsevier, and Acers from the American Ceramic Society for generously funding this podcast. And Colabite for the music. As always, you can reach out to us. We are very active on socials. We post on the r slash materials subreddit. You can send us an email at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. And then Instagram, the, um, what is it? At materialism.podcast? What is yeah, our- at materialism.podcast. And Instagram with at materialism.podcast. We will respond quickly. If you give us a follow and send us a message, send us your idea for the next episode. We'd love to hear it. All right. See you guys next time. <laughs>